Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, today, we're going to be talking about indigenous foodways of the American South, and we have Dr. Margaret Scarry here from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Thank you so much for um, coming today through Zoom. <laughs> All right. Are you ready for me to start then? Yeah. Um, go, uh, yep. Go, go. I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a little odd joining to Zoom. I'm here in Chapel Hill at the University of um, North um, Carolina at Chapel Hill, where I'm director of the research labs of um, archeology. span Tonight, as you can see by my title, I'm going to talk about um, indigenous foodways of the American South. Um, and I wanna start by defining food ways for you. And what I mean by that term is it's an all encompassing term that includes all aspects about how people acquire, prepare, consume and think about their food. So it's kind of an umbrella term for anything that people do with food. Um, and it includes the practicalities as well as the social traditions that surround food. Uh, food ways are said to be conservative in the sense that they resist, people are somewhat resistant to changing the ways that they interact with food. But in reality, foodways are moving targets. Um, people rework their foodways as they put notions about what and how to eat into practice as different foods become available, as their economic circumstances change. So, so we need to think about tradition as something that's not fixed in, um, in stone, but very malleable as um, people act out um, their, their lives. Uh, before, before I start talking about the indigenous foodways, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about uh, myself. I'm trained as an archaeobotanist, uh, which means that I'm an archaeologist who specializes in um, identifying and interpreting uh, plant remains that are found in archaeological sites. My training and much of my research over the course of my career has focused on the foodways of the indigenous communities of the American South, uh, particularly the later pre-colonial period, about a thousand um, AD to um, into the period when the colonists begin to interact with um, native peoples. But but I've also worked for about 20 years on a project on, um, on Crete. Um, the late pre-colonial South and archaic Greece may seem like very different times and places and, and, and plants that people were eating. Um, but the common thread to my research is an interest in the ways that people changed their um, farming strategies and at the same time or going along with that, changed the way they used food in social circumstances. So a connection between what people are doing economically and and the ways they're using um, food um, in, in their social contexts. Uh, tonight, what I want to do is give you a taste of very broad changes in indu indigenous foodways um, across the American South over the long history that Native peoples um, were, were here. And so mostly I'm going to be focusing on the practical aspects of food and the kind of economic um, aspects and not so much tonight on the, the social uses of food. Out. One question that I know comes up for people not so familiar with archaeologists or archaeology is how is it that we can tell you about what people were doing for food in the past, what they were eating and how they were using it? And there are basic evidence um, is much of it comes from um, people's garbage, the refuse that they throw away after preparing food or at the end of a, of a meal. And so um, here on this slide, what you're seeing is just a, a hole that's dug in the um, 
in the earth, um, a pit as archaeologists would call it, that was filled with garbage. And what you're seeing are some potsherds here, broken pieces of cooking vessels and animal bones um, that were part of a discarded meal. What you can't see in this picture because they tend to be quite small and not readily visible um, are the plant remains that are there as well, the kind of burned seeds and uh, nutshells and, and so on that were um, discarded at the end of the meal. Uh, we also can use um, tools that people used for acquiring their food and preparing their food as some clues to what they were doing, as well as the um, cooking pots and other kinds of technology uh, um, as well to help us provide clues. Uh, in order to, to do this, um, particularly for plant remains, we need to use special means for recovering um, the, the food remains from archeological sites. For, for the plant remains, we often use a process called flotation that uses water to separate seeds and other kind of light buoyant items from the pottery sherds and the heavy animal bones and, and so on like that. Once we... Um, have extracted the um, food remains, the plant remains from the soil. Uh, we bring them back to the lab where we analyze them under low power magnification. And we can in fact identify um, different seeds and nutshells by their sizes and their surface textures and their, and, the, and their shapes. And so what you see here that looks like a kind of a black black mess of little dots is a mixture of two different kinds of seeds that I'll be talking about um, later in, in, a, in a few minutes, um, quinopod, which is a relative of quinoa, um, and knotweed seeds. And so a mass of seeds that had been um, discarded because somebody had a cooking accident or perhaps they overcharred them when they were um, getting them ready to put into to storage. We can, using um, recovery methods like flotation, um, recover things as small as the poppy seeds on the buns that you sometimes eat sometimes eat with your sandwiches. So really quite small things that we can't see with our naked eyes, but once we put them under the microscope, we can identify them. All right, let's now move to talking about the um, native peoples of the American South and their um, food ways. The, the map I'm showing you here um, is plot the distribution of some of the tribes who were living in the uh, American South during the early colonial era. Um, and you'll notice that there are many different tribes and many of them you probably don't recognize their names because they're people who later in time um, merged with other groups and became the tribes that we, we know today. Um, how people lived in the American South through time, varied uh, um, through time, going back thousands of, of years um, and across the, the region, but at any given time, if you look at the um, people um, living in the, the South, you would find that they, they, had, they spoke different languages, but they shared broadly similar ways um, and culture, life ways and cultural practices, as well as economic practices. And a, a good way to think about it is to think about some of the um, diversity of people and how they lived in, in Europe in, in the past, where there's a lot of common commonalities amongst people who are now Germans and French and, and English um, and so on. And they, but they still all have their distinct cultures and variations on cultural practices. And so that's a good way to think about the um, people of the um, American South. Um, so what I'm going to emphasize um, tonight is really the commonalities amongst the uh, people who were living in, in the South and how, how those practices changed over time. And I'm not going to focus as much on kind of the regional variation at any one period of time, 
I would note though, since you are all um, presumably joining me from the Southern part of Florida, that much of what I say really applies to the area kind of Tallahassee and, and North, that the Southern part of Florida excuse me, is a bit different, um, largely due to the, the, the subtropical um, environment and the very rich um, uh, water resources in, that surround the peninsula. All right, so let's start um, way back in the past when the um, native people's ancestors first entered the Southeast. Um, we don't actually know exactly when people first arrived in the Southeast, but we do know that people were living here by around 12,000 years ago. Um, and that they, their basic economic way of life, how they went about getting their um, food um, stayed fairly stable across the South until about 5,000 years ago. And so you're talking about, you know, <laughs> excuse me, a period of over 7,000 years where people were living as what we could call foragers or hunters and gatherers. Now, at the early end of this period of time, um, people living farther north um, were living in a more glaciated environment and um, largely living on um, hunting big game, uh, but in the American South, not so, so much. Um, in the American South, um, even the very early period, people may have occasionally killed a very large animal, but for the most part, the game that they were um, hunting um, for, for their meat are animals that we would recognize and, and hunt today. Um, bear were utilized, um, hunted, um, although there aren't a lot of them, so it was, there were not a major source of meat. Uh, deer were probably the most common large um, mammal um, that they relied on for meat. And then they hunted a variety of animals um, like raccoons and other mammals um, similar in size to raccoons, um, as well as relying on um, Turkey. So these animals that I have on the screen are among the most common animals for which we find the bones um, in people's food, um, food residues and garbage. Uh, in addition to the the um, the, ma the mammals and the turkey that people were were hunting, um, people who lived near the oceans or lakes or rivers uh, made extensive use of the abundant um, aquatic resources. They they gathered shellfish. They they fished using nets and fish traps of various sorts, and they they hunted migratory wildfowl like. Um, waterfowl like ducks and other birds that, that migrate. And so these animals that I've shown you in the last two slides um, were kind of common sources of meat throughout time. The, what people did for meat and protein really didn't change a lot over time. Now, in any particular place that people may have emphasized one animal over another, or may have relied more heavily on fish than on land mammals, but the basic set of animals remains um, largely the same. People, um, the, the native people of, um, the South didn't use domesticated or farm animals um, prior to the time that the European colonists arrived. The only domesticated animal they had were, were dogs. Turning to the, the plant foods about which, of course, I know a bit more as an archaeobotanist, um, a major source of food for people who were um, hunters and gatherers or foragers in the American South were the abundant um, nut crops of the, um, the forests of the, of the South. Um, people relied on um, 
hickory nuts of various sorts, um, as well as acorns, um, and to a lesser extent, um, hazelnuts and black walnuts. Now, the hickory nuts and black walnuts are um, very rich in oils and high in protein. So you can think of them in terms of the, their dietary role as being primarily kind of a protein and oil kind of um, substance to um, in the culinary uses. Whereas um, the, the acorns are much higher in carbohydrates and the starches and not so much in, in the oils. So acorns would have been a, a source of carbohydrates for the diets. And these are all resources that can be um, gathered um, in large quantities in the fall when they, they ripen and then dried and stored for use later in the year. Uh, besides the, the nuts that would have been, you could think of as staple foods of the diet, kind of mainstays of the diet, um, people also gathered a variety of um, fruits that from trees and shrubs, depending on, on where they live, that might include um, grape or maypops, persimmon were a common one, blackberries, um, and so on, most of which could be um, dried, but um, were really used think of these as um, kind of sources for the most part of supplementary vitamins and mineral as well as some variety in the diet and less as kind of the, the main caloric sources for people. People also gathered seeds, um, the small kind of starchy and oily seeds from a number of plants that tend to grow in um, open um, habitats, have somewhat of a weedy um, habit about them. Um, the ones that I have um, illustrated here or the kinopod or otherwise known as um, goosefoot and in sunflower, but they used a variety of other ones as well. Sometime around um, 5,000 years ago, people began to change their economic strategies. They continued to hunt, they continued to gather, but they added another um, line of resources or a strategy to their um, food acquisition practices. And, and that is they began to grow crops. It's the time around 5,000 years ago, we have the first evidence for people actually planting and um, harvesting uh, crops in, in gardens and, and fields. Okay. But um, what most people um, may not know is that the earliest crops that the people of the American South um, were growing are not the maize and beans, or corn and beans, if you will, that we associate with um, native people of, of the, the South, but rather a suite of plants that we archaeologists call the Eastern Agricultural um, Complex. And I'll introduce you to these plants in, in just a minute. Um, but these plants were um, grown and used for thousands of, several thousand years before um, native people began to grow corn and beans. All right, our first evidence for the Eastern agricultural um, complex comes from this area that's outlined by the dotted um, line and kind of the mid south and our very best evidence comes from a number of sites in the Ozark, Ar Ozark area of Arkansas where there are some dry rock shelters and then again from um, dry rock shelters in Kentucky. Um, this is where we have the earliest evidence for the use of the Eastern Agricultural Complex, but through time it kind of spreads out from there into the Northeast and into other parts of the, um, the American South. Um, our evidence from the dry rock shelter are some of these spectacular um, finds. Here you see a bundle, clearly an intentionally made um, bundle of a plant called maygrass that was stashed away at, a, at the back of a, a dry rock shelter. This um, nicely knotted 
bag was full of um, kinopod seeds where this um, now dried and somewhat um, collapsed um, gourd was full of a mix of um, kinopod and knotweed seeds. Um, from their location and these kind of large quantities of these things that we're finding, um, we suspect either people were either putting them in the dry backs of these rock shelters, either as a good place to store food where um, the kind of very dry air would help improve their shelf life, or quite possibly this is where they were storing their seed stock for the next year's um, planting. Um, and then the, these, these um, ones that we have found archaeologically were ones that obviously no people did not manage to come back and, and um, recover, recover. Okay, so, so we, we know that people were using these small seeded plants in large quantities from these kinds of rock shelter deposits, these bags and bundles of, of seeds, um, but we also have evidence from the seeds themselves, and I'm not going to go into the details, um, but basically as plants, as people interact with plants and they sow them and they harvest them and they choose plants that have particular characteristics that they want to try to grow for the next year, um, that has consequences um, for the genetics of the plants and which then shows up in changes in the, the seeds, sometimes in the seeds themselves. And so sometimes the seeds change form a little bit, their seed coats sometimes often get thinner, uh, which is what you're you're seeing here. Um, these are scanning electron microscope slides, um, pictures of kinopod and knotweed seeds and the the wild forms and um, domesticated forms. The the other thing that we can see and document archaeologically is that there are changes in the sizes of the seeds themselves. Here you see a wild size um, sumpweed seed, and here's a domesticated um, size sumpweed we'd see that it, some point is the same as Iva, excuse me, um, that is the um, beyond the range of anything that you would find in the wild. Um, on the left of the screen are sunflower heads where the, the wild forms of sunflower um, heads are, are quite small and there are very many of them on a plant and under domestication, they get um, much larger and um, have, have more, more seeds. And so we, we can find evidence of these kinds of changes and track them through, through time in the archaeological record. Okay, so let's look at the cast of characters that belong to the Eastern Agricultural Complex. The earliest um, ones for which we have um, archaeological evidence are bottle gourd and a form of squash that is um, the ancestor to today's um, kind of ornamental, what we would call an ornamental gourd. Um, and the, the evidence for these shows up at around 5,000 years ago. And hence, that's the point at which we begin, we, we talk about the beginnings of farming, although it's entirely possible that it went back farther in time and we simply don't have archeological evidence for it. So the interesting things about these um, two plants is that um, in their wild form, and presumably when people started to, to grow them, they're both plants with whose fruits have hard, thin outer walls. Think about a bottle gourd, the kinds of gourds that we make dippers and birdhouses out of. Um, that's the kind of um, fruit that they had and not the fleshy fruits that we associate with today's squashes. So the seeds themselves were probably edible and are a good source of oil. And but the the fruits may have been used for as containers, dippers and um, bottles and um, maybe floats for fishing nets, um, as well as um, these being a source of oily seeds. Over time, the bottle gourd maintains its um, hard, thin um, rind, but the, the, um, the ornamental gourd variety of squash um, develops a fleshy form that I'll show you in a bit. <clears throat> 
Okay, so we have the two members of the squash family that are the earliest. Um, are the evidence for a, um, a plants with oily seeds comes not very much later than that. So two to 400 years later in time, archeologically, um, we begin to pick up evidence for domesticated forms of sunflower and then um, a relative of sunflower that is no longer a crop, um, the, the sumpweed or iva. Um, and these are both sources of oily um, seeds that can be used in, in cooking or as we do sometimes today, just eaten um, as, a, um, as, a, as a snack or in, cooked into um, other kinds of foods. Uh, somewhat later in time, we get um, evidence for domestication of two plants that have um, seeds that are not so, so much sources of oil as they are sources of carbohydrates. Um, the one that is um, the kind of most abundant in the archaeological record um, is what's what we call kinopod. Um, another common name for it is goosefoot or lamb's quarter. Um, it is a a relative of the plant that we eat today as quinoa. Um, the quinoa that we um, that's sold in the grocery stores today is a South American plant, but this quinoa pod is a, a, a close relative. Um, the reason I have this um, mason jar here is this jar of seeds, this pipe jar of seeds, um, all came from this single quinoa pod plant. So we're talking about um, resources or potential food resources that even though the individual seeds are very small, um, what on mass they can be a significant um, source of food. Uh, the other starchy seed that we um, that that we have um, evidence for domestication of is the erect knotweed. Um, today we know it primarily as a weed in the sidewalks and in our yards, um, but it also has a nice um, starchy seed. Um, the the closest thing that you might be familiar with um, is it's a relative of buckwheat. Okay, so with the plants I've described to this point, we can actually, with careful um, analysis um, and, and study of the seeds and other parts of the plants um, from numerous, ar numerous archeological sites, we can actually demonstrate that these plants um, showed changes under domestication. Um, that these plants were responded to being planted and cultivated and harvested by changing morphologically and genetically. We have two other plants that we include in the Eastern agricultural complex that we don't have any evidence or we don't have evidence yet, we haven't been able to find evidence that they actually responded in ways that changed the plants. So we talk about these as cultivated plants, but not domesticated plants. And these two are both members of the grass family. One is maygrass, the other is little barley. We find the seeds of these two plants in large quantities in association with the, one, the seeds that we know are from crop plants. And we also find reasonably large quantities of seeds of these plants um, in places and sites that are outside of the native range of the plants. So we're pretty confident that these plants, um, that maygrass and little barley, were being grown in gardens cu and cultivated um, but they didn't necessarily respond genetically in the ways that um, would result in a domesticated plant. The, um, the other interesting thing about maygrass and little barley is that they are both plants that um, ripen and set their um, seeds in um, late spring, early summer, hence the name maygrass, uh, so that they, as a crop, they would have been providing a source of carbohydrates um, at a time of year when most other plants um, 
seeds and so on are not yet ready um, for harvest or consumption. So the other plants, the knotweed and the kina pod and the iva and, um, and sunflower are fall ripe, late summer fall ripening uh, plants. So these, um, these members of the grass family um, would have provided a, a welcome source of carbohydrate um, at the relatively beginning of the, the growing season when other food resources plant resources may have been fairly scarce. Um, so we, we know people were um, growing these, planting these, um, these seeds in gardens and cultivating and, and harvesting them. They continued to use um, acorns and hickory nuts, um, as well as quite a wide variety of fruits. Um, we don't really have any way of knowing for sure, but we strongly suspect that people were managing the woodlands, that they were um, tending the trees um, that, that gave them um, fruit and nuts that they were relying on for food in ways that enhanced um, their production, perhaps thinning the, the forest a bit to um, let the um, productive trees get more sunlight, um, doing other kinds of things that would enhance the, the nut crops or the, the fruit crops. So we think there was a degree of forest management or even perhaps true arbora culture um, that went along with the um, planting of the Eastern agricultural um, complex. So the, the most of the um, cultivation of the Eastern agricultural complex plants um, went out in went out of use or out of practice um, before Europeans arrived. Um, it was replaced um, by cultivation of um, corn and, and some other crops, which we'll talk about in a moment. So we, we don't know, we don't have historic records. We don't know a huge amount about how people cultivated these, um, these Eastern agricultural crops. Some of them, the kina pods and the knotweeds and the maygrass and the little barley, were probably planted by broadcast sowing, the way that wheat and barley would have been planted in, um, in Europe and um, the Near East um, before um, modern agriculture. In other words, you, you take handfuls of the seeds and you, stro you, you, um, you strew it around on, on your, your field. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. The um, the extent of gardens and fields in which these crops were raised quite likely varied depending on the place you're talking about. In some places like the mid south, where where we have the earliest evidence for these crops, um, later in time it's clear that people were planting and tending fairly extensive fields of the Eastern agricultural complex. In other places, um, it appears that people were growing much smaller quantities in fairly modest sized um, gardens. The planting and tending of these crops was almost certainly um, the work of women. Um, at the time that Europeans uh, arrived in the uh, American South and, in the, and observed American tribes, um, it was the women who were farmers while the men were, were hunters. And we, um, we believe that that tradition of farming being women's um, responsibility probably is, goes deep back in, in time. Um, these women would have been very knowledgeable and skilled farmers. They, they selected particular um, seeds to replant for the next years. We have evidence of multiple varieties of some of these um, crops. Um, and they shared that knowledge in the, the seeds from, from one group to, to another, because you can't simply um, observe somebody um, planting seeds and go home and try it and be very successful as a farmer. You have to understand when to plant 
plant and how to tend them properly and when they when they're ripe. He really needs a significant agricultural knowledge to go along with um, the the seeds themselves to be successful at farming. And so we think that there was a sharing of knowledge across tribal boundaries as well as um, trade in in seeds as the um, crops spread from the their original kind of area in the mid south. All right, so the Eastern Agricultural Complex, um, as we understand it, be, um, first started somewhere around 5,000 years ago, maybe earlier, um, and people um, were, grew these crops in combination with hunting and gathering nuts and things from the, from the um, wild for several thousand years um, be, before um, corn comes into the eastern U.S. or before maize comes into the US, eastern U.S. Um, there's been um, some recent work on redating the appearance of corn in the eastern U.S. and the American South. And now it seems that most of the early reported dates are, um, are problematic in various ways that I'm not going to go into. But the best evidence that we have now is that maize spread into the eastern woodlands and into the American South um, about um, 1200 years ago, that would be about 800 um, AD. So you have from 5,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago when people were growing Eastern agricultural plant crops but did not have um, maize. Now, maize is not a plant that's native to the American South. Maize was a plant that its wild relatives are um, native to um, Mesoamerica and Central America where it was domesticated um, roughly at the same time and perhaps even earlier than the Eastern agricultural crops were, were domesticated. And, but it, but it, it becomes widespread in Mesoamerica, um, Mexico, spreads into the American Southwest, um, but doesn't reach the Eastern US for several thousand years after it first begins to be used um, elsewhere. Um, in part, that may have to do with the trade networks that, um, that spanned the um, North American content, continent. Um, but there is also, it's also possible that um, it took a while for maize, which is originally a tropical plant, um, and has particular um, day length requirements to adapt to a form that actually would be successful in the American South. So our best evidence today is that maize was domesticated in Mesoamerica. And as the arrow on the slide shows, it spread into the Southwest and then up across the plains um, into the Midwest and then down into the, um, the South. Um, as with the Eastern Agricultural Complex, as the seeds for growing maize were passed from one group to another, uh, the knowledge had to travel with it. The agricultural practices that would make um, you a successful maize um, farmer needed to be shared because maize is not a plant that's grown in the same ways that the Eastern Agricultural Complex plants are. So maize comes into the Eastern um, United States, in North America, Eastern North America, the American South, roughly 1,200 um, years ago, within a couple centuries. So quite rapidly, um, maize becomes a dominant um, crop throughout the American South. So that by a thousand years ago, um, maize is widespread and being grown at a fair, quite a large scale. In some places, people continued to grow the Eastern agricultural um, crops alongside of maize for several centuries. In other places, as they switched to maize farming, um, they dropped their um, previous um, crops, the Eastern agricultural complex. So one, how do we know that maize came in so late? Some of this is um, by doing direct dates on maize remains that have been 
um, radiocarbon dates that are, uh, may remain that have been recovered from archaeological sites. Um, we do find that a roughly 800 AD, you begin to find um, fragments of maize cobs and maize kernels at numerous um, archaeological sites across the American South. And then over the next couple um, centuries, the remains of, the, of maize become um, ubiquitous and more abundant. So the maize remains themselves tell us um, something about the dating and when it became an important crop. Another way we know is by looking at the, the bone chemistry um, from human remains and also from deer and other agricultural pests who come into the fields and eat maize. Maize has a particular carbon isotope um, signature that is different from um, temperate plants. And you, if you measure the ratios of the two different ca carbon isotopes, um, you can estimate how whether somebody is eating a significant quantity of maize or not. And so what this graph is showing you is here going along, here's um, the um, a thousand, right at 1000 AD, suddenly the isotope ratios um, change and signify, signifying that people are eating um, um, significantly um, more maize or more plants that have this particular isotope. And when you're, when you're talking about the American South, you're basically talking about maize. So the, the bone chemistry data um, parallels or um, complements what we get from the actual plant remains themselves. Um, roughly in the same time frame, we also get new forms of cooking pots um, and that suggests that um, people are adjusting, adjusting their culinary practices to a, a new crop um, that has different cooking requirements and different ways of being consumed. Okay, so, so maize comes in about 1200 years ago. And um, then somewhere around um, a thousand years ago, um, we get a new form of squash. So by this time, um, on the here on the left of the screen um, are the um, are squashes that are the descendants of the Eastern agricultural complex squash. In other words, um, the yellow crooknecks, um, the little ornamental gourds, and probably acorn squash are descended from our American South um, indigenous um, domesticated squash. These big Halloween pumpkin pie type pumpkins um, are come from a different variety of subspecies of squash that was domesticated in Mesoamerica. And we first find evidence for this form of um, this variety of squash in the American South um, around a thousand years ago. So a couple of centuries after maize comes into the Eastern US and into the American South, you get a new form of squash added to those um, that had been grown for millennia. And then finally, a couple hundred years after that, around 800 years ago, or around 1200 AD, um, beans first arrive in the um, Eastern US in the American South. So beans are another um, uh, resource plant crop that um, were domesticated in um, Mesoamerica um, and then ultimately spread into the American South, but they're the latecomer of the crop complex. So over a period of four to 500 years, you get maize and then the pumpkin squashes and then um, beans. These three plants, the maize, beans, and squash, of course, are what most of us associate with um, indigenous um, foodways. Those, these are the three sisters, the traditional 
crops of the indigenous peoples of the American South and the maize, beans, and squash. And yet, if we look at the deep timeline that I've um, just outlined, uh, they're really they're actually a fairly late tradition um, that. Um, comes together only about 800 years ago, but then comes to really dominate um, people's uh, farming practices. Okay. The um, cultivation of the three sisters uh, it varies in scale in much the same way that the Eastern agricultural crops uh, varied in scale. In some places, people um, planted and tended and harvested um, crops from vast areas, uh, areas of um, agricultural field. When the Spaniards went through the area in the um, mid 1500s, went through the area where Tallahassee is now, they talk about riding through miles of corn fields. Elsewhere, people were probably um, farming much smaller plots of land, growing corn and supplementing it more with the gathered re resources. Um, maize, beans and squash are farmed in different ways for, than the Eastern agricultural complex. Um, you're probably familiar with the idea that you plant the um, corn in distinct hills rather than um, broadcasting it. When you go to plant it, you, you dig a hole and you plant an individual seed and it has to be well spaced out. You can then plant beans around the corn plants to let them use the corn stalks as poles for the vines to climb up. And you can plant the squashes so that they grow down the rows and, uh, and so on. But it's a different kind of agricultural field than a broadcast. Um, uh, field of kinopod or maygrass, which would be more like a European wheat field than it would be like a corn field. Um, the tradition of um, women being the primary farmers continues so that as maize, um, beans, and squash become come to dominate um, the the pe people's diets, it's women's work that are providing the staples of the the diet. They they do the, they plant, they cultivate, they harvest, and by tradition they control the products of their their work. In other words, they control the stored um, maize. So as, May, as the three sisters come to become important in the um, economies of the people of the American um, South, um, we see kind of a variable pattern with res respect to the um, Eastern agricultural um, complex crops that preceded them. Some of them go extinct. We no longer have domesticated crop forms of the the native kinopod, um, the little little barley, may grass, um, sump weed, or erect knotweed. Um, they disappear as crops, some of them before Europeans arrive, some of them seem to have hung on just a little way into um, the early colonial period and then pretty much um, disappear. But we do have a few crops that are important today that are descendants of the Eastern agricultural crops. Um, the bottle gourds um, continue. Um, the, as I said, the, um, some of the uh, fleshy squashes that we eat today, many of the ones that we could call summer squashes, the yellow crooknecks and the um, zucchinis are descendants of our American South crops. And then of course, sunflower is an important source of oil in the world today. So I've talked primarily about um, these plants as um, crops and as part of the economy. I want to say a few words um, about um, how people uh, prepared and used um, the, these foods. And we're going to start with um, the, the nuts, um, which have, of course, a very deep um, history of use. If you're just going to eat nuts the way we do today, hickory nuts, you crack them and you pick the nut meat out of the shell individually. 
but that's not an efficient um, or effective way of having much of a food supply if you want to process large quantities of hickory nuts. Now pecans, you know, if you crack a pecan, the nut meat comes out fairly readily, but um, hickory nuts are different. They have all that kind of internal shell configuration and the nuts are very kind of tightly, the nut meat is kind of tightly encased in the, in the shell and you have to pick it out um, with considerable labor. So rather than um, spend an enormous amount of time that it would take to, to pick the nut meats out and discard the shell, um, the people in the um, indigenous people of the American South um, made often made what is called um, hickory oil or in as in the case on this slide, the, um, the, what, what a product that the Cherokee call um, kanaji. And what you do is you you gather lots and lots of hickory nuts, um, dry them, and then you crack them kind of roughly to get, and you throw out the ones that are wormy or spoiled and you pick out the biggest pieces of nutshell. And then you take the mass of nut meat and lots of little pieces of um, nutshell and you pound it all together and you um, form it into a, a ball. And so what you see down here in the um, right hand corner of this slide is what's called a kanaji ball. And it's just a kind of a golf ball or slightly baseball sized mass of hickory nut meat with lots of little pieces of nutshell um, embedded in it. And now you, you know, if you were to try to eat that, um, you would probably break your teeth. But what you can do is if you throw it in a pot of boiling water, the, the nutshell will sink and the oily mass of nut meat kind of disperses into the water and makes a thick broth and you can either let it the oil float to the surface and skim it off for for cooking or you can basically make a stew um, in that pot and just not scoop clear down to the bottom of the pot where the the nut shell is, is residing and so it's a much quicker and more effective way of using large quantities of, of nuts than trying to pick them out individually. Uh, acorns were a very important source of food throughout the pre-colonial period, going back clear to the days when people were, were um, solely foragers and continuing through the Eastern agricultural complex farming and into the maize farming. Um, we don't, most of us today don't eat acorns. Um, they, they can be very bitter. Uh, there are two big groups of oak trees. One is called the red oaks and one is called the white oaks. And the, the white oaks produce um, acorns that are bitter but can be eaten as they are. Um, red oaks um, produced um, acorns that have a very high content of tannic acid and they're just really not edible um, as they are. And so if you're going to take advantage of the carbohydrates um, in acorns, you need to do a bit more processing of them than you do of the, the um, hickory nuts. And so you, you, once again, you can gather enormous quantities of acorns when they're ripe in, in the fall dry them, but then before you use them for cooking, you have to leach out the tannic acid. And so there are various ways of, of doing that. You can um, put them in a pit in a sandy soil and pour repeated rinsings of water through them and eventually the tannic acid will leach out into the ground and you've got edible um, nut meats. Um, you can speed up the process by boiling the um, nut meats in large quantities of water, changing out the water several times as you do it. And again, eventually you, um, the, the tannic um, acid is leached out and you have a edible um, nut meat that is high in carbohydrate. Now to our tastes, it would probably still be bitter, 
but if you think about things like coffee, we, we humans can certainly um, develop a taste for for bitterness. And so the fact that it remains a little bitterness is well, is, is not a, a matter of um, concern. And in fact, there's some evidence that um, Native peoples of the South um, had a um, a preference for slightly bitter foods, whereas Europeans, when they first encountered natives, um, liked salty things, the native people tended to prefer bitter to salty. We don't know a whole lot about the ways that people would have um, produced an er prepared and eaten the, um, the starchy uh, seeds of the Eastern agricultural complex. Our best uh, parallel or model would be um, the quinoa um, that we eat today where you might um, boil the um, quinopod seeds or the mangrass seeds or the nut wheat knotweed seeds um, and until most of the water is gone and have a somewhat dry rice or pilaf type dish, or it, they, um, they may well have used the, um, the seeds um, of both the starchy um, plants as well as the sunflower and um, some wheat seeds in stews and soups and things like that. When maize comes in, I mentioned that new, a new form of pot shows up along with maize in many um, archaeological sites. Um, we th think that what, what is happening here is we have the introduction not just of a new source of carbohydrate and a new crop, but of a new dish, and that is um, hominy or, or safki. Um, and so the, the, the key to hominy is it takes a um, particular form of corn with um, a high starch content, um, but you mix the, the flint corn um, with wood ash and let it soak. It's essentially mixing it with a form of lye. It helps the take get the outer seed coat off of the corn kernel, but it also changes the nutrient com Component content of of the of the hominy. So maize is deficient in several amino acids, and if you eat a diet that is very high in um, in corn, um, but but without creating um, something like hominy, hominy um, you can develop nutritional uh, nutritional disease known as pellagra, which can be quite serious. But if you add the wood ash and process the, the corn properly, um, you can release some of the amino acids. It improves the, um, mineral, the um, vitamin and amino acid content of the, the dish and um, for the most part can um, avoid the problem of the nutrient deficiencies. Um, and so we think that the new forms of pots that come in are particularly good for long-term kind of long um, cooking that is appropriate for, for making harmony or safki. So again, the hominy can be eaten by itself, um, but it can also be used as a base for stews and have other kinds of things added to it. Um, one thing that's interesting to note that some is that some of the processing is a bit similar to the way acorns would have been processed um, as well. And the hominy um, processed with wood ash does have a bit of a bitter taste. And so again, this kind of bitter palate to, to the food of, um, of the people of the American South. Um, I haven't said much about beverages. So just a quick note about a form of 
tea known as black drink. Now the black drink is a ceremonial beverage that um, the Europeans wrote about and that people, many of um, native peoples today still prepare and drink. Its primary um, ingredient are, is, is brewing the leaves of the Yaupon holly or Ilex vomitoria. Um, and it, what it does is it produces a very strong, highly caffeinated um, tea-like beverage. If you've drunk mate, um, mate is made from um, a relative of the, the Yaupon. In ritual context, people added other, some other plants to it, and they used it as a ritual cleansing drink. In other words, people would drink the black drink, um, deliberately throw it up as a way of purifying um, their body. But you can make it in weaker con um, consistencies and not add the other um, plants that really have the purgative um, properties to them and drink it as a kind of a, a, a beverage equivalent to arc tea or coffee. All right, just a few quick words about how South Florida differs. Um, the South Florida, the, the Southern Peninsula of um, Florida at the time of European contact was on the East Coast um, occupied by the Tequesta and some other people. On the West Coast, it was the Calusa. Um, and people here did not um, have their ancestors, let me back up, their ancestors did not, to our knowledge, grow the Eastern agricultural complex plants. Um, nor did the later um, ancestors of the Calusa and Tequesta grow the Three Sisters. Um, at the time that Europeans arrived, the people of South Florida were, were mostly um, hunter-gatherers. Now, um, not surprisingly, um, they lived off the bounty of the, the sea and ate large quantities of fish, um, shellfish, some sea mammals, and of course hunted deer and some other land animals, but a huge emphasis on marine um, resources for their protein. The um, protein sources, the fish and game, were complemented by gathering a variety of um, wild fruits. Uh, but these, the ones for which we have um, evidence tend to be these kind of subtropical uh, plants that for the most part, or in many cases were not available to people who lived farther north. And so you have um, hog plum and cocoa plum a prickly pear, which is a bit more widespread, uh, false mastic, and they also um, seem to have consumed fairly large quantities or used fairly large quantities of the fruits from the cabbage palm and saw palmetto, both of which again have somewhat of a bitter um, consist taste to them. We do have a little bit of evidence um, from the west coast, the southwest coast of, of Florida, from the Calusa area for gardening. We have um, evidence for the use of bottle gourds and squash. Um, so a couple members of the Eastern Agricultural Complex, but none of the starchy and oily seeds. Um, and then we have um, some evidence for people growing uh, a couple of plants that they probably acquired through trade with people in the Caribbean. Um, we have evidence for the use of papaya and um, chili peppers. Now these probably were grown in quite small scale gardens or um, basically you can think of these as dooryard gardens or home gardens, um, you know, planted close to people's residence to provide some supplementary um, foods, but not the staples and um, mainstays of people's diets. And so um, I'm going to end there and um, let you ask questions if you have them. <laughs>
Thank you so much for sharing this knowledge. I found it um, very interesting, especially since I was born and raised in California. We learned <laughs> Where they uh, ate lots of acorns. <laughs> yes. Um, I was always fascinated, but then they would tell us not to eat the acorns that, that we found on the schoolyard. <laughs> you have to know how to prepare them. Yeah. Um, I will ask, is there anything from their way of life that we should probably incorporate now into like how they raise their crops or anything like that? Oh boy, what a big question. Um, just to, I mean, it's it falls into the conversations about sustainable ways of um, living um, and kind of an attention to, um, I'm not sure where I'm going with that. Um, I think that there um, is some potential for thinking about some of these plants that we talk about as the Eastern agricultural complex or lost crops as potential um, resources that could be brought back into domestication or, or used um, and to think about kind of broadening the diversity of our diets um, more than anything else. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any foods that are still around kind of native way of being prepared that, that we eat today? Um, how many? So um, the, we, you know, you can actually buy canned hominy in the, um, in certain, some grocery stores. Uh, the, the kind of using flint corn for making hominy is a, a practice that spread from native peoples um, into European populations. Um, but, and in fact, um, was taken back to Europe, but the process of um, preparing it with the lye in a way that releases the nutrients, that knowledge didn't get transferred in some cases. Um, and so we have early on when maize was first being grown and eaten in large quantities in, in Europe, and then also um, in North America in the late 1900s and early um, and I don't mean late 1900s, late 1800s and early 1900s, um, we do see evidence for um, pellagra, the nutrient disease, because the knowledge about how to process the, the maize to, to release its nutrients wasn't passed along or was not adopted along with the, um, the, other, form, the other parts of processing hominy. With us not getting the process passed along, is there any way to potentially find that process or maybe have somebody share it with us? Or is well, that- Well, so native, I mean, native people, you know, people, Cherokee, Choctaw, et cetera, today still process it, um, hominy in the with with wood ash and in ways that are you know appropriate it, it's just that at particular moments in in history and particularly when um maize was first introduced to to europe and went back on the ships and um people began to grow it because it's a very um productive crop the the knowledge of how to pro process it was not passed along at that point in time. Um, and the same during the um, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, and particularly during the depression, um, there people were eating far more corn, but didn't, but were not aware of the, um, the, the nutritional aspects of it. Okay. It's not a problem if you're eating adequate animal protein it's a problem when your diet is way too, is, um, you know, excessively high in corn and not many other things that provide your full um, set of amino acids that you need to, to create protein. Got you. Um, with, with going to the animals, I know back then they used like every bit of the animals. We saw them make it into tools and such. Mm -hmm. Do, 
do you think that's a lost art today? No, I don't think it's a lost art. I think it's um, something that, you know, most um, people are not practicing anymore. Um, you know, this, some of the tools that were made out of um, animal bone may be, you know, less durable than comparable tools made out of metal or other um, things. But I think there are people who still have the, those skills. Yeah. We, you know, most um, people today don't eat the, the same kind of variety range of animals. There are a lot of the animals that people would have eaten, hunted and eaten in the past that we really don't think of as um, food much of the time. True. I know even um, I was talking to a friend earlier and they they didn't like deer, but I like deer and I was introduced to that because my mom's Cajun. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So but but, you know, we think of venison as an acceptable food, but there are other animals that people have eat, may have eaten in the past that many people don't really think of as food. Um, and that's true worldwide. That's not just true of indigenous peoples. True we culturally define some things as food and other things as not food, even, even when some are edible. Looks like that's all the questions we have. Is there any other final uh, notes you would like to share before we close out tonight? Um, no, I'm, I appreciate people um, listening and I'm sorry that I can't see your faces and interact with you more directly. <laughs> Well, hopefully one day we will we'll get over the hump. Of <laughs> that would be mail. lovely. Yep. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Scary, for all everything you shared. And okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, everybody have a great night. All right. Good night. <laughs>